In this video, we'll be making a 3D version of Fireboy and Water Girl. Okay, she just died. And he's still running. Yes, let me retry. It won't look as amazing as this because I've been making this in my spare time. But as you can see, the Fireboy can walk through the red, but when he hits the blue, he dies. And the girl hits the red. Okay. Anyway, so if you've never played Fireboy or Water Girl, it's this little platformer here where you control both characters. And I just died with the girl because I wasn't paying attention. You control the fire boy with the arrow keys and the girl with the W A D keys or whatever. And we'll be doing the same thing in our Unreal Engine project. And there's also these switches here, which we'll be setting up as well. So the player hits the lever, the platform comes down. And then if you hit the lever again, the platform is going to go back up. We'll be making that as well, like a very simplified version. One thing to note is that if you are brand new to Unreal Engine, I move pretty quickly because there's a lot of stuff that we're covering here. So just make sure you pause the video often, take it slow, rewind, do things like that. I'm not going to be building out this level for you. You can find some free assets on the marketplace to do that. What's important is learning like the functionality for like moving two characters with one keyboard, these pools of water that kill like the red player or the blue player the moving platform that we'll be setting up, as well as like the game over menu. So lots of cool things to learn. So make sure you have the Epic Launcher here. And then in the library here, you can add Unreal Engine 4.26.2. And if you enjoy this video, check the link in the description for my courses here. Each one's 20 bucks, except for this new one I did. It's only 15. But we're making a side scroller in this video, and I hope you enjoy it. So let's jump into it. So the first thing we're going to do is launch 4.26.2, the latest version. We want to make a game, obviously, so let's go to next. And then we will do a side scroller, not 2D side scroller. I just want to do a regular side scroller. It's going to be like a 3D fire boy and water girl. So click next, project name, fire butt, <laughs> and click create. So this is what the editor looks like the first time you launch the project, the side scroller project. Now this video isn't going to deal so much with the artwork. You can always go in the marketplace, find some art. So for example, you might want some stone type of walls and platforms. So come over to free up here and then go to the permanently free collection. And on the second page, there's this medieval dungeon. And so if you go in here and download this, you might find this to be a good package for just assets for like a side scroller. You got these walls, these torches, things like that, but you can use whatever art you want. So just go through the marketplace, find some free stuff, or if you've bought a lot of assets, just pick whichever ones you want to use. But for the sake of this video, I'm not going to spend so much time on the art. I'm going to spend a lot of time on just teaching you the actual programming, the blueprinting. And that's really one of the most difficult parts that people don't know how to do is how do you have two pawns on the screen at the same time? How do you have two players, right? So if you go up here and you do two, this actually isn't correct. It's going to give you two windows. And this isn't really what we want, right? I don't even think they can see each other. Yeah, they can't even see each other. So this is definitely not what you want. Even if you put this as like two clients. So yeah, we have two characters, but like it's, it's weird, right? Again, this is not what we want. We don't want two different screens. We want both players playing on the same screen. So that's the first thing we're going to set up. So if you go to edit project settings and then you type in use split screen. I'm going to actually uncheck this. The thing with Fireboy and Water Girl is that it is just one a one player game. But like if you have a friend with you, you can move the girl with you know the W S A D whatever and your friend can use the arrow keys and move the Fireboy. So we'll be using the same type of movement system. We'll have W A and D move the girl and the arrow keys will move the guy. So what we're going to do in our project here is in the project settings, click on input and then open up these axis mappings here. We're going to add some. We're actually going to change these around a bit. So I'm going to add another one here. So for the action, we do want to jump, but we want to make them specific. So I'll have like a water boy jump, for example. The water boy jump will be the arrow key up. So what you do is you can press this and then press the up button. It's already there, but just showing you how to do it. And then the water girl jump. This is actually W, so I can click that, press W. 
All right, now for axis mappings, we have the move left and right. So I'm just gonna make this more specific. Again, I'm gonna go water boy move right. Just gonna delete all these here. Whoops, okay. All right, water boy move right. This is gonna be the right arrow key. And then put this at negative one. And then add one more. And then left is positive one. And then the water girl move right. So her positive one value is the A key. And her D key is the negative one. So this is all the controls we're going to need. Just the jumping and then the left and the right. Okay, so with this set up, we can actually come back here now. And we're actually going to take this character and kind of change it around. So over on the right, I can browse to the asset. It's in this side scroller BP folder. I'm going to make a new folder up in the content browser for our game. I'm just going to type in water boy, I guess. I don't know. And then I'm going to take our side scroller character. I'm going to copy it to the water boy folder. And I'm only doing this because it just saves us some setup. We could make like a fresh character here, but this just saves us some setup. So I'll make this one and call this the character base like that. And then we right click, create a child. This is gonna be Fireboy, and then duplicate this one. That's Water Girl. Okay, I called this Water Boy for some reason. I'm actually like not smart, okay. Fireboy, I don't know what I was thinking. So let's go ahead and open up Fireboy first. Now again, you can use whatever character you want. If you have like the animations and all that, go ahead and use it. But in our case here, I'll just stick with the mannequin. Why not? And what I'm going to do with the material here is I'm going to browse to it. I'm going to create a material instance. Fireboy. I'm going to open it up. And I can actually change the color here. So we want to make it red. Let's bump this baby up. There we go. Something like that. So I can save this and then I can browse to it and I can actually plug it in there. And now we have our fire boy. Very simple. Wow. All right. Now for water girl, there actually is a female mannequin character. So if you go to mannequin and then the character folder, here she is, the female. So we can take her and actually, well, let's make this the full blueprint editor. Gonna plug her in like that. And she uses the same animation blueprint, so it's good. But she uses a different material, so I need to actually take this material here and let's make it blue. Something like that. Oh, there you go. Water girl. She's ready. Okay, but we need to edit this capsule. It's just like way too big. So I'm gonna go 64. And then, okay, that's way too small. Let's try 84. Let's see, let's actually go to a left view here. All right, so turn off snapping. Let's get her right at the base. Okay, something like that. Back to perspective, yeah. So that's good for me. It's only gonna be moving left to right, which means actually this camera, we wanna get rid of the camera. So let's open up the character base with this wrench. And we got to redo this stuff. We'll get to that in a little bit. Actually, just delete the touch input. We don't care about that. But let's delete the camera stuff here. So we just have that. And we'll actually be doing the movement in the player controller. So I'm actually going to just take this stuff and delete it. So let's look at the Fireboy level here, what we got. It's basically each level is a box. It's got these obstacles. We got this fire stuff that will kill you. We got these gems to collect. We got this lever for the elevator here. We've got a button here. I believe the button lowers this platform. We've got a rock here that the players can push. And then once they get to the top, Fireboy has a door for him and Water Girl has a door for her. And they both got to get there to win. I'm sure you already know about that, but this is just stuff we have to do for the game. So the first thing I want to actually do is this view, this camera view here. But I don't want to do like a full 2D type game. I want to make it a little bit three-dimensional. 
So in our level here, just going to delete that stuff there. Going to delete all this stuff here. I'll delete the floor. And we can delete that character. That's just a placeholder. I'm actually going to go full screen because I want to kind of get like a general idea. So obviously this is like a square. But for your game, it might be like on the TV, for example. So we want to so we want to get the perspective as if we're playing on the television. So something about here, like maybe in this spot here, this is where we want to put the camera. You know, maybe this is just a little bit taller. And again, if you have like actual assets, go ahead and use them. I'm actually going to take this one and just like duplicate it. So this could be like our side walls and then let's bring one out here. Let's rotate it with the E key. Scale it up, scaled up with the R key. And then let's like delete this stuff, for example. And what I want to do is I want to bookmark this location where the camera is. So let's figure out exactly where we want the camera to be. Maybe like right here, right? Maybe this is our arena. Like this is like the top up here or something like that. Maybe a little bit higher. But then this would be the location for the camera. And the camera doesn't move, it's stationary. So in the top left corner, go to bookmarks, set bookmark, bookmark zero. So now we can actually move around. And then when we press the zero key, we come back to here. So this is like our main camera position. So now what we can do is we can get in here and we can start to like move these things around, get them like lined up correctly, start blocking out the level a bit. Something like that. This guy, maybe we want to bring it out some more. Something like that. Okay, let's press the zero key. So it's not exact. So we might have to do a little bit more moving there. And that's better. And again, you can use your own assets, do what you want. The idea with this video is just to kind of teach you how to make this type of game. And then you can spend your own time doing all the artwork and stuff like that. So if you have the artwork, here's like an example of something you can make. Just to kind of show you like a end result here. This isn't finished by any means, but so when I press the Alt P key, you can see I can move both characters and we got this like death water down here. So she'll go in there and she'll die, right? So stuff like that. This is kind of what we're, we're going to be doing and what you can do with your own art assets. But let's get back to our new project here. We're going to be making the gameplay elements that you just saw in that example. So we want to start with the camera. So let's go back out of full screen here. And F11 is full screen, by the way, if I forgot to say that. So in place actors, let's place a camera. Just take a camera, drag it in. And what you can actually do with this camera is you can right click it and you can pilot it. So let's do that. So now let's go full screen again, F11. So now I'm actually piloting the camera. I'm moving around with the camera. And if I press the zero key, this is where it takes us. So you have to kind of decide if this is exactly where you want to be. Maybe I think I want to be a little bit closer because when you get in the camera, the perspective is going to be a little bit different here. But we had it pretty close there. Let's try something like something like this. So I'm going to bookmark, set bookmark, bookmark zero. So now when I leave, I can press zero again. Here we are. Okay. So now I'm going to click this arrow up here. This will take us out of the camera. Now the camera is there. So let's actually lock it. So right click. Oh, it's under transform. So go to transform and then lock actor movement. So now we can't accidentally move it. And again, just press zero so you can kind of see what you're working with here. And I, I like to make sure I'm doing it in full screen mode. It just gives you a better idea of how it's going to actually look. See? So that's our arena. That's level one. All right. So now let's actually work on like the gameplay programming. So I'm going to make a, where's our folder? So here's going to be our main folder. I'm going to make a game mode or actually you can make a game mode. Yeah, we don't have a game mode. We need a game mode. So let's create a game mode. We'll just call this Fireboy game mode. And then this side scroller example map, I'm just going to rename that. So under maps here, I'm just going to rename it. We'll just call this like level one or arena one, whatever you want to do, call it whatever you want. It automatically renames up here. And I'm actually going to take this maps folder and drag it into the content folder at the top. 
And that just puts the maps folder at the root here, which is actually how you want to do it when you package up your games. You want your maps folder just in the root of the content. All right, so just right click, fix up redirectors. I'm going to reopen the map. So now let's grab our game mode here. Let's plug it in. In the world settings here, you can just plug it in. And then let's open it up. What we want here is we don't really need to do any programming. We can just leave this blank for now. But these class defaults, we want to set up our player controller class. And I think that's it because the player controller is going to handle the spawning of the characters. So now let's create our player controller. I'll just do PC underscore waterboy, whatever. So we can take this and we can plug it in to the player controller class here. So we just have our custom player controller. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take this network player start. I'm going to delete it. We're going to create our own player starts. So the way you do that is you go to blueprint class, open this all classes, player start. So here it is. We're going to make our own. So select that and we'll do water boy start. And then I'm going to duplicate it with control W water girl start. So we have our own starting spawn classes. We're just making our own custom ones. And I don't want to make this exact level. You can, if you want, but like just for the sake of this video, I'm not going to spend like a couple hours making all this. I did that in the example project here. This is pretty similar. So for example, I'm just going to take this, I'll duplicate it, and then let's just scale this down. And actually, let's bring in a character here. Let me see how big this guy is. Okay, that did not get placed in the right spot. Okay. So yeah, he's actually, you can see he's relatively not that big, right? This level's a lot bigger than you would think. So I actually think his size is decent. Maybe he needs to be a little bit bigger. Maybe the level's too big, whatever. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. I don't wanna be too much of a perfectionist. I'm just trying to teach you the gameplay side of things here so you can run off on your own and do things. So we want the guy to spawn here and we want the girl to spawn up here, okay? So let's go grab our water boy start. Uh, drag it down here. And then I'm going to rotate it with the E key at 90 degrees. And then we got to put him like that. Okay, so that's the guy. Now let's grab the water girl start. Place her up there. Rotate 90. Okay, something like that. So we have our two starting locations. Let me just delete these things. And then I will duplicate this so we kind of have like a roof here. I'll extend that way out. But let's actually get the characters spawning. Let me show you how to do spawning. If I was to play right now, nothing's going to happen. It's just like, wait, what the heck? What's going on? Right? Nothing's happening. And actually, we shouldn't even be spawning here. Like, even this is wrong. And what's happening here is in our game mode, it's spawning us as the default pawn. We don't want that. So take this and select none. And then now when we play, we're, we're just nothing. We're just out here in the middle of nowhere. But what we want to do is we want to spawn with this camera being the viewport, right? So to do that, we actually need to select the camera and then in details here, scroll down and then this auto activate for player, set this to player zero because this is just like a couch co-op or a single player game. We want this camera just to auto activate for player zero, which is just one like the single player. So now when we play, we're in this viewport here. So we can go to full screen and here is the layout. So what it looks like now, our level is done. Yay. But now we want to actually spawn the characters here. So let's open up our player controller water boy. And we actually need another player controller. So you want to duplicate this and make this the player controller water girl. Why do I keep saying water boy? What is wrong with me? Too much Adam Sandler. All right, fire boy. There we go. Okay, so open up the water girl here. Open up Fire Boy. And this is kind of like a nifty trick. I had to do some research to figure out how to control two pawns from one keyboard. It's actually not an easy thing to do. 
There's not a lot of information about it. So I might be the only video on YouTube that's going to show you how to do this. I don't know. I couldn't find much on this, but this is what we're going to do. What we want to do on begin play in this player controller here, because this is our main player controller, right? If you go to the game mode, we plugged in this Fireboy player controller. But each pawn needs a separate player controller. You can't control two pawns or two different characters with one player controller. Each character or pawn or whatever needs its own controller. So when we play the game, if we were to spawn both the Fireboy and the Water Girl, player one can't control both characters from just the Fireboy player controller. We need to make another player controller in order to control the girl. We need to actually spawn that this second Water Girl player controller here in order to actually control this girl here using the same keyboard. It's, it's really confusing. That's why there's not a lot of information on this. So what we want to do is in the Fireboy player controller on begin play, we want to do a spawn actor from class. And what we want to spawn is our water girl player controller. So we're going to spawn this new player controller. We're going to say always spawn ignore collisions and this transform. I'm just going to split it. That lets it compile. And we'll just spawn it at 0, 0, 0. It's fine. But then from here, we want to promote this to a variable. Call this the water girl PC or player controller. And now this is the first thing we want to do. So we want to spawn this player controller into the world. So I'm actually going to put a sequence node here with the S key. So like this is the first thing we do before anything else. All right. So now what we want to do, now that we've spawned the player controller, now we want to spawn the actual characters. We want to bring these two into the world at, the, uh, at their uh, starting location here. So we want the fire boy to spawn down here and the water girl to spawn up here. So to do that, so drag off and do get all actors of class. And the class we want to grab is our fire boy spawn. What the heck did I call it? Water boy start. What is wrong with me? Fire boy start. Okay. Anyway, this is going to be a meme at this point. Fire boy start. So what happens is when the game starts, the player controller is going to grab all the fire boy starts in the level. There's only one of them. So it's just going to grab this one here. Where is it? Right. Come on. Right there. And then what we want to do is we just want to loop through each one, but there's only one of them. So for this one element right here, this is the one on the level. We want to spawn actor from class. Okay, you can delete that. But what we want to do now is I'm going to split this. Actually, no, we can drag off this and type in transform. Get actor transform. Let's split this and then split this. We don't want to plug in the scale because if you plug in the scale, it's actually going to spawn the character with this scale. So that's okay if your characters have a 111 scale, but let's say you're using something else. Like I can, I don't have to use this starting location class. I could technically use anything to spawn a character. I've used like notes and things like that because we're just grabbing a whatever class is in the level. We could use like an empty actor that we just drop in the level if we wanted to. And if that scales off, then it will spawn your character with like a different scale. There's actually an example of this in my platformer game tutorial where the scale was different and then the characters were, were respawning like really tall and skinny and stuff. It was kind of funny. But anyway, let's plug in the location and the rotation. And then always spawn. We want them to always spawn. And the class to spawn, this is our Fireboy character right here. Yes, spawn them, please. And I'm actually going to make this a variable. You'll see why in a minute. This is Fireboy. And then we want to type possess in pawn. So now this player controller here, this PC underscore fireboy will control this pawn, this fireboy pawn that we spawn into the level. So actually, if I play now, it should, he should spawn. Yeah, you can see him in the corner there. We can't move yet. Let me do it so it's bigger. But yeah, so you can see him now and he's looking the correct way. Okay, so we got the guy spawning. We got fireboy spawning, not water boy. So now we got to get Water Girl to spawn. So that's going to be a, the second part here. We're going to do a very similar thing here. So I'm actually going to take all of this and select it. Control W. Cut 
copy and pasting code, baby. That's the way. Okay, so we want to do water girl start now. Okay, good. This is all good. Change this to water girl character. Delete that. Promote it to a variable. Water girl. But we don't want this player controller to possess her. We want this player controller that we created to possess her. So bring out water girl PC variable and then plug, I think like that. Yeah, plug that there and then like that. Okay. Okay, hold on. I think I have to disconnect that first and then, yeah, okay. So disconnect that, refresh, just some weird. Okay, refresh again, compile, plug that in. Okay, now we're good, yeah. So that happens when you copy and paste for each loops that are connected to other classes. It was retaining the information of Fireboy. Like if you hover over here, it says water girl start object reference. But before I did all that fixing that you just saw me do, it was saying Fireboy. So it was giving us that error. So to fix it, you just have to disconnect everything like this. You have to disconnect all the object pins and then compile. And then it will let you plug them back in. All right, so we're good now. Now we should have both characters spawning. Yeah, see, we have both characters spawning now. Sweet. So now we're going to be able to move both characters from one controller or one keyboard. That's the idea here. That's how the game works, right? So we want to bring out our... Actually, let's do jump first. Jump's easy. So just right-click, type in jump. We get Fireboy jump. Right-click, type in jump again. Water girl jump. I'm going to bring out the Fireboy. Okay, that's not it. Bring out Fireboy. Get it. Drag off, type jump. So all of this we're doing in the player controller. We're doing all our controlling in the controller. So a lot of games or templates and things like that that you'll get on the marketplace, they do a lot of things, like they do a lot of the movement in the actual character. Like you saw earlier, this character base had the movement in here. We deleted it because we're doing all the movement in the player controller, which is actually how, like it, it depends on the game. But generally, you can do movement and stuff in your characters, but it really does just depend on your game. Some games you're going to want to do it in the player controller, which is the case here. We want to do movement in the player controller in this type of game. So anyway, the player presses the jump key. He jumps. Drag off type stop jumping. These are just functions that come with the characters by default. You can compile this, and now our fire boy will be able to jump. So we want to do the same thing, but for Water Girl. So bring out Water Girl. Plug her in. And now we should be able to jump with both characters. So let's go ahead and play. Let's make this bigger. So jump for Fireboy is the up arrow. So press the up arrow. You can see he's jumping. Water Girl is W. So now we're controlling both characters from our keyboard. So now to move left and right. So the way to do that is move right. We got these two events. We want both of them, Fireboy and Water Girl. So to do this, this is actually a different. You can't actually bring out like Fireboy like this and do, maybe we can. Let's see. Add movement input. So maybe we can do this. You can also use get controlled pawn. But the issue is that pawn, see, okay. So if you notice this jump function, the target is character here. So a character, if you don't know how the hierarchy works in Unreal Engine, the character class is like it derives from the pawn class. So the pawn class is above the character class. So the characters have this jump function in them, but pawns don't. So it's kind of confusing, but this variable is a character. You can see up in the variable type, it's Fireboy, but it's a character type. So we're able to access jump from here, but this add movement input, it says target is pawn. So pawns have this add movement input function in the base class. We can still grab the add movement input from pawn here, but if you wanted to, you didn't want to use this variable. Like let's say you just didn't set these variables for your type of game because some games you just won't, you don't need to do that. You would use get controlled pawn like this, and then you can just use this and you can plug that in. So use this instead of the character if you want. In our case, just to keep things consistent, I will use Fireboy here. 
If this doesn't work, I don't see why it wouldn't, but if it doesn't, I'll use get controlled pawn because it is different there. Like we can't use get controlled pawn for water girl move right because this player controller, we're on the fireboy player controller here. And this Fireboy player controller is controlling Fireboy. It's not controlling Water Girl. Even though we have a reference to Water Girl and we can jump, she technically has her own player controller here, even though we're not doing any code in it. It's very confusing. But for example, down here, I definitely want to use Water Girl here. We want to use to add the movement input and then plug this in here. And then we only want the character going left and right for the most part. So for the direction here, I'm going to drag off, get control rotation, and then get right vector. So this is like positive right, negative right, which is going left, right, world direction, whatever. So that's that stuff there. But up here, we'll try this. We'll see. We'll do the same thing. I'm just going to control W this. Plug that in. Oh, I forgot to plug in this access value. Make sure you plug that in. All right, let's see if we can move Fireboy. Yeah, so we can still move Fireboy, but if you don't want to use this variable, like I was saying, you could use get controlled pawn. And I like using get controlled pawn in general, especially when I'm working with interfaces. But for this particular game, you can use the Fireboy variable up here if you want. It's no big deal. And some of these shortcuts I'm doing are really handy. Like if you hold down the control key, you can drag these pins. And as long as you're dragging into a, like this is getting a pawn object reference. This is a character which derives from pawn, so we can plug this into both. You can just move pins around. Or if you hold down the alt key, you will disconnect a pin. Very handy. And then you can just go like this really quickly. All right, so. Apparently, setting the arrows facing this way is incorrect. Go back to your player starts and rotate them back 90 degrees so the arrow is facing towards the camera. Now, when we play, the characters are facing the camera, just like in the game, actually. And then now, when we press the right key, I can move this guy, I can move her, I can jump with them. Yay! And they're not able to fall off the world which is good to see. But obviously this movement's different. So let's go to the actual Fireboy game. When you move, you start out slow and then you kind of speed up a little bit. And then there's not a lot of gravity. You can see the gravity is kind of like being on the moon. So when we jump with her, you can see how far she goes. Okay, she just poofed. So we want to set up a gravity system that's kind of like that. So go to your character base here. Go to character movement. And we have all these values we can mess around with, especially for just gravity scale. We have jumping and the air control, things like that. Acceleration. So I'm going to change the gravity to, let's go 0.4. And then acceleration. I'm going to lower this a lot to like 128. You can mess around with these numbers, get a number that you like. Walkable floor angle. I'm going to put this way up actually. That lets you walk up like really steep slopes. Round friction of three. I don't know if that's correct. I'm just gonna put that back to its default. Max walk speed, we wanna be slower. Let's go to 400 here. And then now for the jumping, the Z velocity, let's change this. Let's make this lower. And then air control. We definitely want air control because you can kind of move around in Fireboy when you're, you're falling around. And then the lateral friction, let's try a one. Okay, so compile that. And let's just try out those numbers. Okay, so the Fireboy starts out slow, starts moving. You can see how, okay, yeah. So it's pretty good. I'm actually not, yeah, I'm actually kind of happy with that. You can see when I jump, like when I'm at full speed and I jump, I can kind of turn and stop. It's kind of what we want. She's got the same thing going on too. Boom, yeah, cool. So we got the movement down for the most part. And again, you can mess around with those numbers here in the character movement. And make sure you're doing this in the character base because this will affect both the girl and the guy. But maybe you want different numbers for the guy. So in that case, you would edit these values in the actual specific character here. All right. So at this point, if you want, you can like flesh out your level, do whatever you want. But again, with the art side, you might be able to come up with your own ideas and just do your own thing. 
this tutorial is more about just like teaching you just a different type of game that you don't really see a lot out there. You don't really see games like this, but it's kind of showing you how you can make a game that people can play on with one keyboard. You have a friend sitting next to you. They can control the girl. You can control the guy. It's pretty cool. But let's make the death part now. Let's make that little fire pit. So right here we have this, this fire thing. If Waterboy touches it, he's okay. But if he touches the blue one, he dies, right? So let's do something like that. That's some cool gameplay programming. So let's go to our folder here. Let's create a blueprint class of actor. We'll call this one the, I'm not gonna do a base class for this. I'll just make them separate classes. Red pool, and then I'm gonna control W, blue pool, whatever, I don't know. Let's just work on one at a time. Actually, no, let's not even, don't even duplicate yet. So delete that, we'll make one. And then once we have one working, like let's get the red pool working completely. Once it's working completely, we'll duplicate it and make a few changes so that it kills the uh, blue girl. So anyway, let's open this up. Up here in the root, I'm gonna add a box collision. So search for box, make this the root. All right, so this box is what will kill the player. So with the box selected, scroll down, and under collision presets, I'm gonna do custom, ignore everything except for overlap pawn. That's it, we just want it overlapping with the player. Scroll down some more and then on component begin overlap. We wanna check if it's colliding with the player or not and I like to use tags. So search for actor has tag. And then we gotta set up tags for our player. So this is the red pool. So the red pool does not kill the, well I guess there's two ways you could do it. You could have this search for the red player and then say if it's the red player, don't kill him. But I think it would be easier to say if it's the blue player or not. So the red pool is searching for the blue player. So I'm gonna type in blue here. And then in our water girl, or you can use whatever tag, right? You could just tag, let's just be more specific. Let's say water girl. All right, you can use whatever tag you want, but you have to make sure that this tag matches the tag in your actor. So in our water girl character, class defaults up here, I'm gonna search for tag. And then now we can add a tag here. So just add a tag, type in water girl. So now our girl here has this tag and this red pool actor, this uh, box here, when it gets overlapped by a character, it's gonna search if it's water girl or not. So let's just add a branch here. So if it is the water girl, we wanna kill her. If it's not, if it's fire boy, just do nothing. So we need to set up a function here that will kill the player. So we can either use interfaces or we can just cast. I'll just cast to keep things simple. So let's go to our character base here. Let's make a custom event. So right click, custom event. Or you could even make a function if you want. You can do whichever one you want, it's up to you. But what I'm gonna do is this function will get called by this class here when it overlaps a character. So off of this other actor, we can cast to character base, plug that in, and then off of here, we can kill player, and that's it. We just wanted to kill player and then reset the game, but we'll get to that later. So kill player, how do we kill the player? So I'll show you how I like to do it. We take our mesh here, so drag it in. We're gonna do a rag doll. So type in set collision profile name. For the profile name, type rag doll. And then I wanna do wake all rigid bodies like this. And then set simulate physics to true. It might already be true, I can't remember, but let's do that anyway. Yeah, so this is a very simple death event, just does rag doll physics. And now let's do something with this now. So right now this red pool is just an invisible box. So let me try to get it at least on the level. Okay, so it's just an invisible box. So to spice that up, again, you can go find like some particles, some things like that. I'll just show you how like a very simple way. Let's add a light, gonna add a point light here. So here's the point light. 
or here's the blueprint rather. Let's make this a red light. So this light color here, just move it to red. See how it looks here. Looks okay. You could actually edit it here if you want. Just like change it here. But anyway, just make it red. One, zero, zero. I guess that's the easiest way to do red. Make it super bright if you want, whatever. So in my sample project here, I had some like mist particles I plugged in and then this like water plane, very, very super simple. We might even have that in our project. It might come with the engine. I'm not sure, but it's really this mist effect that helps the light in the actual game. It makes it much easier to see, right? But we don't have mist in this template. So you're gonna have to like find some mist on your own or something like that. Just find a project. Maybe that free dungeon one has some mist. I'm not sure. But yeah, I'll let you guys worry about that. So now I'm going to take this red pool now and duplicate it. And now this is our blue pool. So let's open up blue pool. Let's change water girl here to fire boy for the tag. Okay. So now in our fire boy character, search for tag. Let's add a fire boy tag. So now in the blue pool here, this one will kill fire boy. Fireboy only, it will ignore the girl. So let's drag the blue pool in. It's also going to have a red light. But I can just select the light here, make this blue. Like that. And now it's this actual, okay, so I accidentally moved the point light out of there. Make sure it's in the middle of your collision box. All right, there we go. Okay, so let's put the blue one here. Let's take the box, let's select it, and then now we can kind of open up the box here a bit. And let's just bring it down. Let's move the light a bit. You can see why having a water material really helps here. And there are free water materials on the marketplace, so you can find some there. For the sake of time, I won't do that. I'll just make this, let's see, hold on. Bring down the attention radius to like 150 here so it's really centralized and then bump this number up. Okay, something like that. Boom. All right, same thing here. What was the max? 100,000. And then what do we do for the attenuation? 150. Okay. So I want to copy the size of this collision volume in the blue one here. I want to copy it into the red blueprint here. So the way you do that is I click on the blueprint here and then I select the collision volume. I can actually right click these values here. So I can right click location and copy. And then here in the red pool, I can select the box and then paste. So it sends it to the same location. That's actually not what I want to do. I want to copy the scale here. Whoops. Okay, paste. There we go. All right, now let's move the light in the middle. Okay, so this, in our game at least, this will give the player, whoops, make sure you select the actual blueprint if you're trying to move it. But this will give the player a general idea of where the death volume is. So when we play now, this girl, when she touches the blue or the red light, she should die. Ah, she's dead. Okay, so now the red guy here, he should be okay, right? So he's able to walk in the red and not die. He does seem to be stuck on something. I think he's stuck on her uh, capsule right now. You can't really tell, but like it's invisible. I'm actually colliding with her capsule. It's not, that's the problem with ragdoll physics is the capsule is actually not where the character mesh is. But anyway, let me just die here and then we'll fix that. Okay, so he dies. Ah, he falls off, that's cool. But let's go fix that capsule issue. So in character base, when the player dies, this capsule is still colliding. So I want to bring this out here. I also want to set it to ragdoll. I think that's all we have to do. Let me see. So I can bring her over. She dies. Okay. Well, she just went flying. And yeah, see, so now I'm not colliding with her capsule. Okay, cool. Oh, he just went. Okay, he went flying. 
Now what happens is when you die, the game actually restarts. Like even if just one character dies. So if we come back here, so she's moving along, you're, you're making progress, but then if she, she dies, even though Fireboy's alive, it doesn't matter, the game ends. So if one character dies, you have to restart. So we gotta set that up here as well. And what we wanna do is just make a very simple widget. So let's go to user interface, widget blueprint. Let's call this the death screen, I guess. So open this up. And this will be a very simple screen here. Let's just bring in a, let's start with a border. I'm going to anchor it to the center like this and then put in a zero, zero for the X and the Y. And then the size, we, just, we can just kind of size it up here. So it'll be something like that. And then for the alignment, just do 0.5 on the X and the Y. It's just gonna be a very simple menu that says like, oh, game over. And then retry or quit or something like that. So to do that, we have to add a vertical box. And then in the vertical box, we can start adding in text. But let's change this white background because it's really ugly. So with the border selected, this brush color is what changes it here. So you can just do whatever color you want. I'm just gonna do something like this. I guess, kind of ugly, but whatever. And so now this text here, this will be our game over, but I want to center it, padding from the top, bring it down a little bit, font, make it way bigger, like that. Maybe the color is like red or yellow. Outline of two. Sure, game over, whatever. Now we wanna do some buttons under this though. So I'm gonna add a button here. Add this button to the vertical box so it will go over the game over. And then in the button we want some text. So add text on top of the button. And then for the button, let's rename it. This is the retry button. I'm actually gonna copy the color from game over here. So select the game over text, right click and copy. And then this new text, I can paste it. And I will do retry. And then I'm gonna change the size a bit. Let's go like 50 outline of one. The button background is really ugly. So that's in this background color, you can change that to zero if you want. So it's just like the text, even though it's a button. So right click, copy this retry button, select the vertical box and then paste. This will be like your quit button or something, or like your main menu. I don't wanna select, I don't wanna spend time making a main menu in this video, but yeah, you could have this go into like the main menu or something. I'm just gonna put quit. And we want to space these out. So to do that, you can actually get what's called a spacer up here. And let me actually minimize this so you can see. I'm going to put it between the buttons like this. And then now we can bump up the Y value here. And let's put one between game over as well. So there's one right here now. So like that. And then now I can bring this one in a little bit. All right. All right, very simple little like game over screen. So what we wanna do is we wanna set the visibility to hidden by default. So by default, the player won't see this. All right, so let's watch what happens when the player dies. So the player dies, and then the window slides up from the bottom. So let's do that. We can actually do that through animation here. So let's make an animation. Do game over anim, that's how I like to always say anim at the end. And what we can do now is with this border, we wanna select the border here. Let's actually position it like down here, right? You can drag this Y value in the alignment. I'm gonna put it right here. I'm gonna click this keyframe. Whoops, yeah, so right here in the timeline, it added it, pretty sure, yeah. So you can see the Y negative 1.05, that's what we have here. So the menu is gonna start here at zero seconds. And then what we wanna do is about one second later, we want to bring this up to 0.5. So then add a keyframe. So now when we play, 
That's the animation. And there's other things you can do with the animation. This is just giving you a general idea of how it works. But now in the graph here, on the construct here, I'm gonna drag this game over anim here, play animation, and then plug that in. And so what we'll do is when the player dies, we'll draw this widget to the screen. So in the character here, kill player, we wanna do this. I'm gonna delay for one second, and then we're going to create widget. We want to create a death screen for owning player here. Just type in, whoops, type in git player controller. Yoink. And then add to viewport. Okay, so now let's play. So the girl runs in, she dies. One second later, it should come up. There it is. Okay, so we don't have a mouse though. You notice we don't have a mouse? Let me show you how to add that. We also want to add our mouse. So want to set show mouse cursor to true. And then set input mode UI only. The widget to focus is that one. Okay, let's play again. So she goes in, she dies. And then now we have our mouse. So we can click retry and quit. The buttons don't do anything yet, so let's go set that up. So here in our death screen, we can click the retry button here, scroll down, and then on clicked. Yoink. So when the player clicks the retry button, the way I'm gonna do it is I'm just gonna open up, I'll just reopen the level. I'll make it so the level reopens. So let's just go open level, level zero one. Now, obviously, if you're gonna have multiple levels, this isn't the best way to do it. You probably wanna store your levels in either the game mode or the game instance. I would say the game instance, you, you would store which level the player currently is on. And every time you go to a new level, you would update that value. And then here on the on clicked, you can do get game instance like this, and then you can cast to your game instance and then get the level, plug it in and open it. Okay. So I know kind of advanced, but that's the way I would do it. So let's try it with this though. So she goes in, she dies. And then I click retry. Now the level opens again, but now I have my mouse. So you actually would have to click to get back into the game. Oh, I still can't play anyway because the game is set to UI mode only. And that's because we set it here. So what we actually want to do is when the game starts up on the level, we want to set it back to in-game only. So actually, we'll do that in the player controller here. So on begin play, before we even spawn the girl here, I'm going to do set show mouse cursor to false. Set input mode game only. Okay, let's try that now. Okay, so she dies. I click retry. It opens up the level. I still can't move. Oh, it really wants me to plug something into here. Okay, well, right click, get self, plug it in. Okay, is it going to work this time? Okay, yeah, so now it's working. So I just had to plug in that self reference into the uh, the game input mode. So right here, make sure you plug in the self here. So now we're looking pretty good. We got water that kills you. We can restart. Now we have these like gem, these pickup things. But when the player picks them up, I actually don't see where they went. Like it, there's no like, there's nothing on the screen that shows that we have those. So I'm not really sure what the point of those are. Oh, then we have the green goo that hurts both players. So let's make that. So let's take this red pool. I'm gonna duplicate it. This will be our green pool. And for this, we just can we can just delete that completely because this kills both players, so we don't even need to check. All we have to do is check if the other actor is a character. If it is, just kill the player. So now let's drag this in. Let's put this one like, well, for the example here, I'll just put it here. And again, let's just change the scale. So I'm going to select this one and copy the scale. Select this one, and for the box, let's paste. And now for the point light, 
make it green. I think I did like 10, like the max. Oh, no, no. Like that. Yeah, there we go. Something like that. Okay, so now this one, this will kill both players. I'll just put it at the beginning here just to test. So she hits that, she dies, and then I can still move, and then, yeah, I die there. Okay. So that is a bug, too. We got to make sure that when one player dies, we can't move the other player. So, so a way we can fix that is here in the player controller, the Fireboy. Let's actually create a new variable called game over. And then I'll just make a new function. We'll do a function for this. F, we'll go F underscore game over. And we will set this to be true. That's it. And now what we want to do is in the event graph, we don't want the player to, pe to uh, be able to move or do anything if the game is over. So a simple way to do that is just on this movement. We don't want to allow movement if the game's over. So bring in our game over variable. We can say if it's not true, if the game is not over, then you can move, right? So copy this, let's paste this wherever the player is uh, doing stuff, wherever the player is moving. We wanna do it there. And then for jumping, we don't want the player to be able to jump. Just on the first one, you don't, you don't have to put it on the release key, just like that. Okay. Now another issue I notice is that when both players die, it pops up the death screen twice. So let's go to the character base here. We kill the player, we delay, then we create a death screen. Now we only want to, we don't want to draw two of them, right? So the way you fix that is you just have to get a little more specific. Let's actually make this a variable. So you call this the just death screen, whatever. You disconnect all that stuff there. Now let's plug this in. And then what we want to do is just move this stuff out of the way. Bring in the variable here. Right click, convert to a validated get. So what we're going to be checking is if this variable is not valid, then we want to create it. And then we set it. But if it is valid, then we don't want to add it to the viewport anymore. We don't want to do this stuff here again. So just connect all this down here and then plug that in there. So essentially, whoops, got to plug that there. So essentially what this is saying is only do this one time. Once this uh, variable becomes valid, don't do it again. So this is just to make sure that if, you know, the blue player dies and then the red player is like right behind her and he dies as well, it won't make two death screens. It'll just make one. So let's just test that out, watch. So I'll have her jump, jump. Okay, so she's gonna fall in. So they both die, but should only, no, still drew it. Okay, so I'm dumb. So what's happening is we're doing all this stuff on the character base, but there's two characters in the game. So obviously this is like not the right way to do it. I just had a major brain fart. Fortunately for us, we can just move this to the player controller, not a big deal. We still wanna do this on the player. But then from here, after this one second, we want to do this widget stuff on the player controller. So the beautiful thing about Blueprint is we can just cut and paste. So grab all of this, press Control X. Let's go to our player controller here. And let's just paste right here. Now this variable is going to look like this because it's not a variable in this Blueprint. So if we compile, it's going to give us an error. Or actually didn't give us an error, which is weird. But anyway, what we want to do is, is right click and then create a variable. So now this widget variable is now created. And what we can do here is make a custom event and then just call it death screen or it's actually, I guess we have to be a little more specific. I'll do draw death screen or something like that. So compile that. And then now in the character base here off of this delay, get player controller 
cast to B PC Fireboy here. And then draw death screen. So even if both players die, it's just going to this one player controller that we have. And it should only do it one time now, hopefully. Oh, we also got to call this game over function. We forgot to call this function. We made it, but then we didn't even call it. So when the character dies here, we want to also do F game over. And actually, you know what? Let's do this. Let's cast here before the delay. And let's do the game over here. Then let's delay one second and then draw the death screen. So we'll immediately freeze movement after, or once a player dies, and then after one second, we draw the death screen. Okay, let's play. So I'm gonna be moving with the red, I'm just gonna be moving with both characters. Okay, I, all right, so now we have one death screen. Let's retry. I'm just gonna be moving with the red guy here. Let her die, okay, so now I can't move with the red guy. Okay, cool. So now our game's kind of coming together here. You're, hopefully you're kind of learning some stuff here how you can take a lot of this logic and just expand on it. And then you can make like a beautiful level, get some good art to spice it up. But this project is literally using the same logic. It just looks prettier because I'm actually using like art assets. So that's the challenge for you is to just build out and flesh out your levels now, do whatever you want. But the next thing I want to do now is this lever. I don't really care so much for these gems that we're picking up because I don't know what they do. Maybe they get added like in the main menu or something. I, I can't remember. I'd rather focus on these levers here. So the levers automatically move. So the player runs into it and then it just like moves it around, see? So when the lever is pushed to the left, the platform drops all the way down. Well, not all the way down. It stops about, yeah, right there. And then with buttons, we have to actually sit on them in order to lower the platform. So now let's make that lever system. I'm gonna make a new blueprint actor here. Just gonna call this a lever, keep it really simple. And if you want, you can go get some like meshes, like a lever mesh or something like that. I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna build it with like a cube here. I'll show you, I'll just add a cube. And this is really big, so let me first bring this into the world just to see. And what I'm going to do is, I, I think this is a good height, right? If we play this, is a pretty good height for like the ceiling and the floors and stuff like that. So I'm going to bring this over here. I will expand it like this. And then this one I'll bring... A little too much there. Okay, something like that. And I'll just put the lever here. And I know it's too big. And then we'll have the elevator go up and down right here. Okay, so let's make this lever smaller. I'm gonna bring this out just so I can get a visual on it. And the cube, I'm just gonna start, I'm just gonna scale it down. And you can see on the left, right over here, how it gets smaller as I edit it in the blueprint here. So we'll do that. This will be like the base of the cube. Maybe I'll do like this actually. Let's go like that. And then I'm gonna add another cube. And this will be the handle. So let me just actually name this so it makes sense. And I'm gonna turn off the snapping for scale right there. All right, so I just want to make this like, like a pole, like that. And then let's see, I want to rotate it. No, so I don't want to rotate it along the Y. So the X right here, okay. So we're gonna have it start, let's see. That's our handle, yay. And then when the player comes up to the handle and touches it, it's gonna rotate. Actually, I want it facing the other way. So let me do this. It's actually kind of difficult. All right, we'll do that. So because the uh, gizmo here isn't at the base of the cube, it's making the rotation kind of hard. But if you have your own mesh, 
You'll be able to do this yourself with your own custom values. But basically, I'm just going to have it like this. It's going to start at what we care about here is the rotation. So it's starting at a rotation of X on 20. Actually, I'll try 25. 25 might be better. So we'll have it start at 25, and then it'll rotate to minus 25. And that's where it is now. And then I can change the color of the material because this is kind of ugly. We'll just make it red so it's easier to see. And then I need to add a collision volume. So I'm going to type in box and get a box collision. But I want this to be attached to the default scene root. So let me move this up. I'm actually just going to zero it out here. And on the scale, there we go. So when the player hits this box, it will move the switch automatically. So I'm going to bring it out a little more. And then we want to add another cube, which will be the platform. So up here, I'll add a cube. This will be the platform that moves, right? So let me just scale this down. And we'll have the player position this in the world. I guess we can also scale it in the world. So if you come over here, I can select the blueprint, and then I can select the platform. You as the developer can place this where you want and scale it up to the correct size. So that's all I'm doing here. So something like that, we want to start there. And then when the player hits the lever, we want it to come down. Well, if we look here, it starts up. So the player has to hit it to bring it down. So this is the farthest the platform comes down. So then the player can jump on it and then be able to jump up. So in our game, we probably want to fall down to about here, something like that. We'll have to do some testing. That might that might actually be too high. We want like enough room for the player to be able to jump up. Let's see. Okay, I should probably move that green goo. It's just in the way. All right, let's try this again. She can't even jump up to the next level. So let's actually make their jump a little bit higher. So I'm going to open up the character base. Jump velocity. Let's try 450. Okay, it's a little bit higher. That's good. All right, so they can jump up. She hits the lever. I can't even jump over the lever now. I hate my life. I'm actually just going to turn off collision for the little handle here. So collision, no collision. It'll just be visual for the sake of this project. All right, so the player hits the switch. It'll move. But yeah, see, so this is too high still. So I need to bring this down a little bit. Let's move the platform down enough so the player can actually jump on it and then jump up onto the next level. Still not low enough. I'll actually raise the second level up a little bit. Okay, into the platform and then up onto the next level. There we go. Okay, so I'll just use this as the location for the platform. And we're going to use its local location. That's why it says 0, minus 545, 35. This is its location relative to zero, zero, zero inside of the blueprint, not in the level. And it's important to understand that we're going to need that. We're going to need this location for when we actually move this. And actually, we might only need the Z value. So see, it's a Z of 35. So we just put 35 there. And then when we move this up, it's like 262. So 260, let's remember this number. Actually, no, we want to remember this number down here. What was it, 35? We want to remember 35. So let's put it to 260. This is where it starts. So the player is going to hit the lever. The lever is going to move. And then we're going to lower this thing with the timeline down to 35 on the Z, OK? So let's put it to 260 as default. And now in here, this is what we want to do in the blueprint graph here. So of course, with the box here, we want it to overlap only pawn, like that. And then on component begin overlap. And we don't need to check if it has a tag or anything. It's an either player, right? So we can actually just cast to pawn here. We're basically saying, is it a pawn object? If it is, then continue, which it will be. And we want to check if it's to the left or the right. 
We just need to make a Boolean for that. Actually, we'll do a different one. We'll say platform down, I guess. So by default, platform down will be false. So it's like, we'll say that this is platform up, right? Or like it's up right here. And then when it comes down, this is down. So before it's moved, platform down is false. So we want to check. We want to say, is platform down not true? If it is, let's move the platform down. If it's false, let's move it to its original location. So we want a vector here as well. We'll say platform down loc, meaning location. Make that a vector and then make it instance editable here. And so this allows us to actually, if we select the blueprint, we can put in a value for the platform down location. And for this, it's gonna be 35, because that's where we're gonna move the platform to. So we're just making this variable here, where is it? We're just making this vector here just so we can have the Z value. And then what we also wanna do actually on begin play, so event begin play, we wanna take this platform, type in location, and it says get world location. We don't want the world location, we want the relative location. So if I do a print string here, and then we play, it says zero minus 545 minus 260 or whatever it said. That's this number right here. See, this is its relative location, relative to the location of the center of this blueprint, which is like 000 in the blueprint, like this spot right there. So we want a reference to that relative location because when we move it, we just want to lower it from that location. So we actually need to take this and promote it to a variable. And we'll say default location. This is what we'll move it back to if the player hits the switch again. So if platform down is not true, now we want to move it. Well, we want to do two things. We want to rotate the lever and then also move the platform down. I want a, another Boolean to do that. We'll say handle moving or something like that. We'll make it a Boolean. And there's different ways that you could do this. This is one way I'm going to do it. I think it's pretty simple to do it this way. We'll use tick instead of a timeline for the handle. We'll use a timeline for the platform though. So what I want to do here is say handle moving is now true. Let's type in event tick up here. We only want tick to be working when handle moving is true. So when it's true, I wanna run a function that will rotate the handle along that X value. So if you press the E key, we have this rotation. We wanna rotate it from 25 on the X to minus 25. So what we can do is we can do another Boolean check here. I'm just gonna put another branch node. And we want to check if the handles, just type in relative location, we can get, or not location, rotation. So get relative rotation. Going to break it. And here's the X. We want to check if this is, what was it, less than minus 25, right? We're going from 25 to minus 25. So this is only going to work for it moving the one way first. We'll, we'll do the other way later. If it's less than negative 25, we want to stop it. We want it to stop working. So if it's true, I want to set actor tick enabled to false. So by default, in the class defaults, let's turn off tick. We only want tick enabled for those like one or two seconds when the player touches the handle. So right here, and duplicate that, we want to say, Tick enable true. And then once this is done, we also want to say handle is false. When this is not true, so when this is false, then this will be running on tick. And this is where we actually do the rotation. So let's grab this handle. Let's go add local rotation. We want to rotate it on the X. So we just have to mess with some numbers here. We do like one. See what happens, that might be way too quick. 
So this stuff here in the tick, this is all for the handle. It's not for the platform yet. We'll get to the platform in a minute. Let me just move this stuff down. Okay, so I'm gonna touch the handle here. Wait. All right, so I'm gonna touch the handle here. Okay, it rotated really oddly. It went the wrong way, so I'm gonna do a negative one on the delta rotation here. So maybe a negative one is the answer, let's see. Okay, yeah, see, so I hit it. And it that's actually a good speed. So negative one is a good speed. So it'll keep rotating until it hits negative 25 and then it will stop. And this being false makes it so tick won't continue here. And we're also disabling tick here too. So we're like basically turning tick off twice, which is fine. We'll worry about the player hitting it again. Let's just get the platform to actually come down now. So this handles the lever moving visually. Now we want to do like move platform. Let's make another event for that actually. So custom event, move platform. And so right here, we will call move platform. You could do this in a function if you want, but I, I really like working in custom events. I will use functions though. Sometimes if I'm like returning data, you have to use them. But anyway, now we can use our timeline here to move the platform. So let's bring out our platform down location and let's do a timeline. So add timeline. Platform movement. Do a play from start. Bring this over here. Double click this. Add a float track. And the length, this is basically the time that it moves. So if you remember in here, it was moving like pretty slowly. So we'll do like, I guess five seconds is okay. So we want to right click, add a key. Put time zero, value zero. Right click at another key, put time five, value one. Now you can do that. You can see how it looks. So basically from zero to five seconds, it's increasing the value from zero to one over five seconds. So what we want to do with this platform is we want to set or just type in location. And we can set the relative location and put this on update. And you don't want to plug this in there. You'll just be setting it to the down location, which we set here, which is 35 or actually, well, hold on. Well, let's just get it moving first and then we can correct it. And this new track zero, we can actually rename that up here in the name. We can rename it to time or something like that. I don't know. That's that value there. But let's do a lerp. So it's starting from its default location. And then we're taking this default location and we just want to move it down on the Z. But if we just plug this in here, it's going to move to 0035. So that's obviously not true. We want to keep the X and the Y of the original relative location, which is still actually zero on the X, but, but it's negative 545 on the Y. So what we could do just to make this easier is we could just look at the relative location here. And obviously the location is zero. We can actually just make this all whole numbers. And so I can just copy the minus 545 here. And then I can just plug that in here. This will just make it easier. So you as a developer, each time you have a lever, wherever you place it in the level, you'll have to manually set these values here. But now I can take this and plug that in. So it's going to move it to that location. And then that's the new location there. It's going to lerp. It's going to lerp over five seconds. So over five seconds, it's going to move from its original starting location down to the down location. All right, let's see if that worked. All right, so I approached the lever here. And you can see the platform moving down. Yoink. Sweet. Let's get up here. Come on. All right, jump. Let's go. Cool. So when this is done moving, we want to set platform down to true. So when it's finished, we want to set it to true. So bring out platform down, set it to true, and then do that. And this is just so if the player comes back and hits it again, it won't move it down again. But actually, we want the player to be able to come back and hit the lever again and then move it 
to raise it, right? Because you can do that in the game. So I'm just moving this. Let's actually rename this event here. Move platform down. And then if this is false, meaning the platform down is true, then we want to do the opposite. We want to move the handle back to its original location and then move the platform up. So again, we want to say that handle moving is true. We want to set tick enabled to true, but we want a new event for move platform up. So custom event move platform up. So hold on, let me do this first part here. Let's do the handle first. So handle moving, we want to do another check here. We want to check if the platform is down or not, because that will tell us which way to move the handle. So we just want to bring out our platform down. And we're basically doing the same thing. We're saying if the, if the platform isn't down, then just do all this that we already have. If it is down though, then we want to do like the opposite basically. So we want to bring it back up. So instead of less than negative 25, we want it to do greater than positive 25. Once it hits a positive 25, we want to stop. We want the lever to stop moving. And we could make this a little bit cleaner. You could bring that here. And we could also plug it into here, right? You can delete that. So it's a little bit cleaner. We don't need these two things here. I can actually delete these. So we could say on false, go here. On true, go here. So we could kind of bring these closer, I guess, make it a little bit cleaner. But if we're moving the lever back to its original position, this X needs to be a positive one. So we can use what's called a select node here. And we can actually plug in the platform down. So we can say if the platform down is true, then we want to move in the positive X. But if it's false, then do a negative one. So we did a lot of little work here and looks kind of confusing, but hopefully it works. Let's go test it out. Okay, so the player will hit the lever. It's going to move down and notice how I'm hitting the lever. Oh, but it is resetting when I hit it. So we got to go fix that bug too. But anyway, the lever stopped moving. When I hit it again, it should go back. Yeah, see how it goes back? So that works there. The player is able to hit it back. But there is an issue with the player colliding with the platform, and then it restarts. So to fix that, we need one more check here. So we'll make a Boolean called platform moving. So we'll bring this out here. We'll say not, and then a branch. And we're basically saying, like the player can keep colliding with the handle, it's gonna run through this. Checking if the platform is down. Okay, so move platform down, but is the platform currently moving? If not, let's set it to true. So we set it to true and then we play. And then at the end here on finish, we can set platform moving back to false. So that way the player can't keep colliding with the lever and moving it around. All right, let's see how it works. So we hit the lever, lever moves. Notice how the platform's still moving. I'm not able to reset it. Okay, when I hit it again, it's gonna go back, there it goes. And then we want the platform to go back up. I know it's not exactly the same as Fireboy and Watergirl, but it's pretty close. So now we wanna do the handle moving back up or the platform moving back up. So we're just gonna do this stuff here. And then here we wanna say move platform up on the overlap. So we actually could use the same timeline and reverse from the end. Then we'd have to do a lot more like Boolean checks in here and stuff like that. It might be too complicated. So I'm just going to create a new timeline. I'm actually just going to copy this one. It creates a new timeline for us. We'll do play from start. This I'm going to rename to platform move down this, this first one here and then this one platform move up so again there's other ways that you could do this but this is how we're doing it so we can actually keep this the same here in the platform you can keep this the same i'm going to copy this stuff here control w 
But now this stuff here, we want to set platform down to not true. We'll set the false here. And then we want to move it from our down location to our default location over the time. Okay, let's see how this is. All right, so I hit the lever, drops down. Just gonna hit it a bunch, debug, nothing happens. Okay, so it's down now. Let's hit the lever again. Hit it and it goes back up. I shouldn't be able to activate it again. Okay, good. So now it's back up. I'm gonna hit the lever again, it comes back down. So there you go, moving platform through a blueprint actor. And then the other one here is this button. You just, when you're hovering over the button, it moves down. When you stop hovering, it goes back up. So it's very similar logic here. And with what you've learned with this lever, you should be able to create this button now. So when you step on the button, it starts to move down. And then when you step off the button, it starts to move back up. Now I'll give you a little hint. What you would use in that case is number one, I would create a whole new actor. I just create a brand new blueprint. You would use a lot of the code that you find in here, like very similar, very similar stuff, right? You won't have a lever, it's just a button, unless you wanna like move the button under the ground or something like that, you could do that. But the platform code is pretty much the same. But you'd also wanna use an end overlap. So if you select the box here, there's an end overlap. And so you would wanna use this. This will fire whenever a player leaves the collision box. So as long as the player is stepping on the button, the begin overlap will fire and that's it. But once the player steps off the button, the player leaves the collision box and then this will fire. And so what you do on the end overlap is you would run the timeline down here that moves it back up. So let that be a challenge for you. See if you can figure it out. And if you can figure that out, you pretty much have your own working side scroller. All you gotta do is just make the artwork look a lot better. We're just you know, using very basic shapes and placeholders here. Find some art that actually looks good. You can come into your lever blueprint here. Instead of using like just like a cube here, you know, you can add in like a nice looking like slab or something like that. You can find some good meshes of like an actual lever and then use that here. But yeah, guys, I'm gonna call the video there. I think we got a lot of cool stuff done here. Hopefully you learned a lot about blueprint, moving platforms around, killing one player but not the other, things like that. Plus, there really isn't any other tutorials that I've seen that actually teach you how to do, you know, two players on one screen with just one, you know, keyboard. So it's pretty cool as well. Oh, yeah. Plus, you have like a little introduction to widgets here. So, yeah, guys, thanks for watching the video. If you're new, feel free to subscribe. Check out my courses. A link in the description if you like the way I teach. Those go much more in depth. You'll actually make like real games and stuff like that. But that's going to do it, guys. Thanks for watching, and I will catch you next time.